no helicopters have been procured for me to go to golf course. Thank you. I've never said he wasn't a great politician. I'm just saying he's a politician. first thing I do. How'd you play out there today? Uh, well, I found the conditions challenging. Mostly because there's no grass on the golf course. But there never has been. I'm thinking about the swag bag, and I, yeah. I hope the swag bag. Trash. When you got three crevices on the green, your course is trash. What's happening, folks? Welcome back to Beltway Golfer Podcast, episode 37. Alex Dixon here. This episode, Brian Kington of Kington Golf Design and Joshua Stevie, who um, I list him as a Lynx soldier uh, because he is a, uh, a Marine Corps veteran and a heavy golfer and does a lot of work with Lynx Soul uh, and as a liaison to their uh, charitable efforts uh, for military veterans. Um, but he's got his hand in a lot of different stuff. Um, this podcast is really... Uh, came about to talk about Laurel Hill. Um, Joshua, Stevie, and Brian Kington met uh, when Josh was interviewing Brian and Bill Love, uh, Brian's uh, partner in Love Golf Design and his essentially his mentor in the uh, golf course design business. Bill Love's now retired. Brian's out on his own. We get into a lot of that in the in the conversation. Um, but <clears throat> Josh and Brian have become golfing buddies essentially ever since meeting during the research of joshua's article i first reached that reached out to joshua after reading that article um we've become friends i've played golf with him a couple times over the years seen joshua really kind of get his hand in all sorts of different areas within the golf world um I, I i've talked to him a couple times about doing this podcast and the idea um often really came and i don't know if it was i don't know whose idea it was but it was it was always we got to do it with brian kington i'm really glad that we did that because brian is now he was uh, out on his own brian's a young guy uh, certainly for for the golf course architecture business and he's really just starting to get revved up so in our conversation um he talks about a, a, a project that apparently has been in the works for, for a very long time, but a, a really high-end private pro project about an hour west of Richmond. Uh, he talks about uh, a short course at Laurel Hill that he's trying to get, uh, get, uh, get, get done or get approved. Um, off camera, we talked about a couple other projects that I'm really excited about, about the D.C. area that uh, unfortunately are still um in certain parts of the process that they're not able to be shared quite yet but uh, i would encourage you uh to follow kington golf design and and beltway golfer as, as i hope to be able to share uh share the news and some of the things he's working on uh before too long um i know while he was in town he he also uh, was doing some work uh some some bunker work at a jefferson district golf course in uh in fairfax um but he's, he's busy. He's moved his home base out to, uh, out to Nevada, uh, but I think he's gonna be back in the DC area quite a bit doing, uh, doing a lot of the projects that we, that we spoke about. Um, Joshua Stevie, he's, he's just a, he's a, he's a golf fanatic. Um, he's, an, he's an ambassador for the game. He's got his hand in, in a lot of different areas. Um, and, the, and the two of them uh, made for a fun conversation. So I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. It's, it's a lot about Laurel Hill Golf Course, but we also talk about the industry and golf course architecture, and you know I think we hit on a bunch of topics, and I and could easily sit down with him for another podcast, and, and maybe will at some point. But um, here's today's episode, uh, episode 37, Beltway Golfer Podcast, Joshua Stevie and Brian Kington. Enjoy. All right, so we're, let's kick this out. So we're we're out here at um, Laurel Hill Golf Club in uh, Lorton, Virginia. Uh, with two gentlemen, Brian Kington and Josh Stevie. Okay. How are you, fellas? Sir Brian Kington. Doing excellent. Sir, Great beer. Well, let's, yeah, we, got, we got a couple beers in the table. Crack these? It, it is Friday, so let's start. We'll crack these all. Thank you guys so long. Brian. Hey, uh, you, hey you, cheers. You to cheers. Good guys. to see you guys. So, so, Josh, we played golf a couple times, and we've met at least a few times. Yeah, man. Brian, I guess we, we've never really, we, we spoke briefly at an event here. What year was that? 2018. 2018. Yeah. That was three that was years a, ago. 
That was an event that you spearheaded, right, Josh? It was. That was a Golfers Journal uh, jailbreak event here, and we ended up raising $35,000 to send some disabled veterans on a dream golf trip to Ireland. So that is that is pretty, pretty awesome. We're we're gonna we're gonna get to that event. We're gonna get to some of the work that you did with the Golfers Journal. This is kind of a new style for me of doing these podcasts because I'm interviewing, I'm essentially squeezing two different interviews in one. Yeah. I'm talking to two guys that I know you guys have become good friends and, and, yeah. and kind of golfing buddies, but you have two very different kind of paths and uh, yeah. relationships with with with, with golf. Yeah. Um, the reason we're here at Laurel Hill is Brian. You know you. Why don't, you, why don't you tell us? I mean, you, you played a huge role in the design and build of this course, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have to give a lot of the credit to uh, my longtime partner, Bill Love. He laid the course out originally. I was only, I had only been working for him for about four years at that time. So I was a few years out of college. I was, he was still very much looking over my shoulder at everything that I did. And, you know. This is what, you, what you're about. 2004, we started construction of the golf exactly. course. So the design was done in 2002, 2003. It was my first project where Bill really cut me loose to supervise the construction. So I was out here, especially living locally, I was out here almost every day, you know, playing in the dirt and, and shaping the features. And, you know, that's how you have to learn this business. You cannot learn it in a school. You have to yeah. learn it. Nobody teaches it in a school. You have to learn it from somebody else. You have to do it the old fashioned way as an, an apprentice, you know, a mentor, protege kind of relationship and, and learn it from somebody who's, who's been in the business a long time, who at one point learned it from somebody else. And that's exactly what I did. So, you know, it's not the kind of, it's not the kind of um, profession that you can learn right away. It takes several years to figure out everything. You know, I, I, I read every book there possibly was to read about golf and golf course architecture before I graduated high school. And, and one of the first things I learned when I walked in Bill Love's office was that I didn't know shit. <laughs> so, so Bill Love is based in College Park, correct? He was, he retired yeah. at the end of last year. So okay, I, didn't know that. Um, I took over the firm and moved to the West Coast. But that was after about a 40-year career and a lot of a lot of airline miles and yeah. a lot of hotel rooms and a lot of a lot of successful golf projects for we'll, Bill. We'll, we'll get to your move as well. But but so you you originally grew up in in New England and then moved down here for college. Right. Stuff? Yeah. I grew up in Connecticut. I, I decided that I wanted to be a golf architect in 1994. I can right. tell you what I was wearing, where I was standing, who I was talking to, and I've never looked back. I I've never had a job. I've only had three different employers in my entire life. I've never had a job that didn't directly relate to this business and and like I said I never looked back I, I ran with it and here we are 27 years later interesting and, and, and Bill Love so so you went to University of Maryland yeah I came down to, to Washington DC to, to go to college I chose University of Maryland they they gave me a scholarship which was nice but I really chose the school because I had a four-year landscape architecture program and scholarship related to landscape landscape right architecture? right oh, wow. and well a lot of, a lot of the LA that? programs are five years <laughs> and I again I knew what I wanted to do and I knew that I had to get a landscape architecture degree to do that but I wanted to be in and out of college and into the business as fast as possible and I think there are maybe three schools in the whole country that only have four-year programs so I picked oh. Maryland and and that's when I met Bill. I didn't, I didn't know of Bill at the time when I agreed to go to school there. Um, so you started interning with him? Like I started interning him halfway through college. Right. And a few of my classmates were doing the same thing. Um, they didn't have an interest in golf course design like I did, but you know, it was an available internship right in the same town as our, as our school. So I started as an intern and then started working full time upon graduation and skipping class a lot junior and senior <laughs> year. <laughs> no, it actually worked out great because um, I got fortune. I mean, landscape architecture it really seems similar to golf course architecture, but it's not. I mean, it, there's very little overlap because golf course architecture is so specialized. So I got lucky in the fact that my primary professor went to grad school with Bill. So he knew Bill very well. He knew that I was getting a more specialized and better education. Well, I was spending more time in Bill's office than in design studio in college. So I was really fortunate in that regard that he allowed me that flexibility to, so to really so spend a lot I mean, of time the, with Bill. The professors at Maryland, they're not, they're not giving you, like, study St. Andrews classes, that kind of no, thing? No, 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 no. Every, every other landscape architecture major wanted to design residential gardens, stuff like that. I was the only one that, that had an interest in golf. And before we get to Laurel Hill, so a couple things. Uh, Bill Love, he, he started working with, with Alt Clark originally. Right. right, yeah, he learned the business from, from Eddie Alt, who has been passed away for a while now, but he's one of the icons in this area. He yeah. did a massive amount of work, mostly in the 60s, 70s, and into the 80s. I actually um, sat down, I sat down with Tom Clark a while ago, but the, the episode before this one, 
I sat down with Brian Alt, Eddie Alt's son, um, who's cool. kind of, who's I, I, he's still working. He's kind of on the tail, right. the tail end of his career. Yeah. Uh, but he talks about Bill Love in our, in our interview, which I haven't I haven't put out yet. Um, but so then, so Bill Love went on his own. You start working with him. But you guys did, also did a significant renovation work at the University of Maryland's golf course, right? Right. We renovated that course in 2008 into 2009. Very successfully. They they had the, the Nike Tour in there, or whatever it was called at the time, for a couple of years. Um, it moved over from Woodmore. Very very successful. That was that was like the PG County Open, which is essentially right. and right. the Nike Tour. You know, after a few different names, now the Corn Ferry. <laughs> right. 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 So and then you know Bill. He lived in College Park, yeah. you know, almost his whole life. I think he moved there when he was 10 or something like that. So he knew that golf course very well and the other local courses. So, you know, projects like that were really special to him, you know, growing up playing the course and having a chance to go back and, and renovate it at some point. So we're going we're, we're gonna to hit pause on you for a second because we're going we're gonna to merge you guys here in a minute. But just, so, Josh, let's, let's, let's go to you for a second. And what's your background? Where, where are you? What, what has brought you? Uh, you know, we, we know you're local, we know you're a huge golfer. We're going to tell yeah. you a lot about your story, yeah, but tell yeah. us a little bit about your background. Um, so I grew up in Southwest Ohio. Um, and after high school, I enlisted in the Marines. Uh, this was 98. Uh, I spent uh, the next nine years in, in the Marine Corps. Um, I did five years in the infantry and four years in communications. A bunch of deployments. Um, and... Uh, Got out um, in 2007 and uh, enrolled at the Ohio State University uh, in the professional golf management program uh, because I wanted to work in the golf business. Yeah, I, I thought I wanted to teach. I've never actually been to Columbus. I yeah. only know the the Ohio State yeah, University yeah. from watching like Monday Night Football when the yeah. guys say that. Is that how everybody it is. It, on yeah, campus yeah, refers? Yeah. It, it's a proper. There actually is a a, a, the, a the on the on the front end of the name. Um, but yeah, I wanted to teach. Um, uh, after spending, uh, you know, uh, almost a decade in, in, in service and, you know, I, I love golf and I wanted to sort of be outside and I like being around, uh, junior golfers and, and, and teaching was really sort of a passion. So that's, that's what I thought I wanted to do. Were um, you a golfer a while in the court? As much as I could. Um, I spent uh, about five years overseas and I was deploying quite a bit. So I didn't get a chance to, to play as much as I as I wanted, but, um, I knew when I got out that like I had a lot of catching up to do, uh, and that's what I wanted to do. Got it. So yeah. what brought you to DC? Uh, so I got my, the, actually the, the, a uh, couple of weeks into my senior year of college, I kind of got the proverbial, you know, offer you cannot refuse. Um, so some folks that I were, was connected to in my, my last job in the core in New York city, um, had donated, uh, $65 million to build this, um, Clinical Research Institute for Traumatic Brain Injury and Severe Post-Traumatic Stress at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center in Bethesda. Um, And um, they reached out to me and asked me to uh, throw my name in the ring to to run the communications for, for, for this facility. So I did and I was selected and um, this was, you know, 2010, the economy was, was, was awful uh housing crisis and um i was making i think nine bucks an hour working at scioto country club in columbus ohio and uh you know picking range balls and trying to learn the business and um and uh you know kind of uh standing alongside a top 100 teacher there by the name of don Sargent, um who is uh you know was was a great friend of mine and mentor uh, but I just, I had a wife, I had a daughter and I was 30 and I couldn't make nine bucks an hour and, uh, and there was kind of no end in sight. So I took this position to come here and got out of the golf business, but clearly have sort of gravitated back towards it and tried to, you know, remain as involved as I can and meeting Brian through, you know, my article, uh, that I wrote about Laurel Hill in the golfer's journal, um, you know, has led to just, you know, not only a great friendship with Brian, but, um, you know, sort of getting back into that community. Sure. So let's um, appreciate that background. So let's get to kind of Laurel Hill, and you just kind of touched on it, how you, you wrote an article about the golf course here, and that kind of yeah. uh, brought you guys together. Um, so so, so back, you, give us the, the, the timeline again. Laurel Hill opened up when? We built it 2004 into 2005. 
so it opened at the end of 2005. The clubhouse wasn't done yet. They were operating out of a trailer. Um, but nonetheless, we opened. What did the, well, let me, even, uh, let me I skipped a part. Let me, let me go back even a little further. When you started work here, because um, you've touched on it a little bit. Josh wrote this, this great article in what issue of the Golfer Journal? Uh, volume 5. Volume 5. Yep. And it goes really into the, the, uh, the history of this right, site. Right, right. And so it's, it's pretty well documented. I think most folks were aware of the old prison, yep. the Lorton prison that was yeah. here. That was the D.C. prison, right? That, that, yeah, it was, that, it was, it was a federal penitentiary. Yeah. Federal penitentiary. Yep. But I, what I didn't know that I learned in your article was the history about it being um, a Nike missile site. Oh, man. It's extraordinary. I mean, and it goes, it, there's, so, there's so much more. I mean, you know, it goes back to, there are, I mean, actual connections here to the Revolutionary War. Uh, you know, Major William Lindsay was the aide-de-camp to General Washington. Um, and he owned the property here at Laurel Hill. The name Laurel Hill comes from William Lindsay's family um, in either Ireland or Scotland. I mean, that, that's where the name Laurel Hill comes from. Um, so there, you know, you know, there was a, a union encampment here during the Civil War. Um, you know, President Teddy Roosevelt sort of, you know, had this very progressive idea of this open air sort of prison without walls. Um, Where they were more working than, than sitting, yeah, in a, yeah. sitting in a cell. It, it, was a, it was a work camp. It was an agricultural prison. I mean, the prisoners, you know, they tilled the fields. They, they milked the cows. They tended the hogs. They, you know, they, they worked the kilns that, that, you know, produce all the bricks uh, that are here. And, you know, it was that way for a long time. I mean, they had, um, you know, the, there was a, a massive overcrowding problem in the prisons in downtown Washington, D.C., and he saw it firsthand, and he said, you know, classic Teddy Roosevelt, he said, you know, what these guys need is access to fresh air and sunlight and a hard day's work. Uh, so they bought this 1,100-acre plot, which is, you know, in this kind of like, at the time, was kind of Virginia horse country, yeah. this very sort of bucolic setting. Um, and you had to actually take a barge from Washington, D.C. to get down here. Uh, down in through the Occoquan and over here, and that's how the first prisoners. The water gets that close. To this yeah, problem. yeah. That's the, the prisoners. That was how the first prisoners actually got to here, and uh, somewhat unbelievably, the prisoners actually built this prison. I mean, they that's wild. the prisoners built their own prison, which yeah. is kind of wild. That's cool. um, when, I, when I was a yeah. kid growing up in this area, you know, there was it, Lorton Prison was more just like. You'd hear stories of yeah. more. Like I was, <laughs> I was a suburban kid from Montgomery County, and yeah. you know, that's how they, you know, they'd scare you about you know yeah. staying too late on the on the streets of DC on a Friday night. Then you know you get picked up and get thrown in Lorton Prison. Well, you know, and that's what was so somewhat ironic about this 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 place and about the prison is that it was intentionally designed to not be that right. It was intentionally designed to be this very progressive place where you. You, you don't just throw people in a cell and sort of lock them away and for however many years and then they get out one day. Um, but ultimately that's what it became. Uh, and it became a very violent, very drug infested uh, place to be. And no longer did prisoners come here to learn a trade or learn a skill. They simply tried to just learn how to survive. Yeah. Yeah, I know towards the end of it, there, there was one, I'm going to kick myself for not remembering his name, but he was a kind of notorious drug dealer mm -hmm. uh, in the D.C. area that famously was connected yep. to Len Bias' death. Oh. And, and his name is escaping me, and I'm going to kick myself for not looking it up before we recorded this. Yeah. Uh, but I know he was one of the more famous guys to, to, to be here towards well, you know, the end there. When I wrote my article, I interviewed the, one of the former wardens, and one of the things that he said to me that really stuck with me was, he said it was such a violent, dangerous place. He said, you know, the old idiom was, you know, it was, uh, it was worse. Uh, what did he say? It was, you're better be better to be caught with a knife mm -hmm. than without one. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> which, makes, which is just saying something. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 okay, Brian, we, we kind of cut you off there before when we were, when you when we got into like. Now you you guys are on site. You know you you and Bill get hired to to turn this into a golf course by Fairfax County, I presume. Indirectly, yes. Uh, the prison closed, I believe, in two thousand one. Uh, we actually got a tour of it in two thousand two, 
and it seemed like it had closed 30 years before. I, I, at the time, when I, when I had the tour, I didn't know when it had closed, and it was just decrepit, there's no oh. pain. I mean, it was really awful. How much it's did like, the, no, it was open a year ago. How much did the, the actual prison property encroach on what yeah. the court, like for people that have played All the course? All of it. So what happened was, there, I think there's some 2,000 acres here, maybe even 2,500, that's not just this prison, but uh, the Occoquan prison, which is, I believe, a, a woman's prison. Um, and all this, where the, the sites where the schools are on the other side of the property here, it was this massive redevelopment project that Fairfax County, they bought the land from the prison and the rest of this land. So the golf course was just one piece of it. So we were actually on a, t on a team with a developer, you know, it's just that one part. So, you know, that developer was, were the ones who were hired to develop the schools, redevelop the prison, who have been doing all this work. Uh, but the prison, to answer your question, this was their... You know, they, they farmed this area. This, these, this was a lot of not just agricultural fields. They had a, a, the 15th hole. There was a big shooting range in there where the guards would train. Yep. Um, there were... The 15th hole, the big uphill par five. Right. That used to be just a big pit. We probably made a... Well, we hauled out a bunch of lead, first of all. But really? then we probably made about a 10, 12-foot fill in there just to fill in that, that shooting range. Um, so it's definitely a, a rather large, multifaceted adaptive reuse project that the golf course was just a piece of but so what did when, the land actually look so was it just crops or is I mean, what, no, it, what looked, it looked like when it, when you well we put it this way we we cleared almost no trees we cleared a few trees at one green and a little bit back in 15 t but the rest of it was like this so it was all just um it's nice and lush now but sure. but normally at this time <laughs> of year everything's kind of browned out and burned out with the with the broom sedge and, and all these out of play areas and it's it's got that golden you know, dry mid-Atlantic summer feel to it. Um, so we didn't do a whole lot. We didn't move a lot of dirt out here. We didn't cut very many trees down, like I said. Um, it was begging for a golf course. There are, there are no shortage of resource protection areas and wetlands and other sensitive areas that we had to work around. But with over 300 acres of land to work with, you know, we, we found enough to, to find 18 wonderful golf holes. And so the routing of the 18 wonderful golf holes, um, that was you and Bill? Right, and you know, like any other course, you end up with a stack of a hundred designs before you find the one that that you move forward with, and that's just the design process, like anything else. Um, I actually recently, when we were moving out of our office last year, stumbled upon the original routing plans, and there are a lot of really yeah, good lot holes that did not get built out here. That it's it's a shame they didn't get. I mean, I'm perfectly satisfied, of course, with the 18 that. That what we is ended that, up what with, is that but... process like? Like I would, I would, I'm, I'm picturing as you're saying this, you know, you've got a hundred different kind of potential holes, maybe like a few different like main routings. Like we could go this way, we could go that right. way. Right. Like how do you whittle that down? Well, it, it always starts with the clubhouse. So we knew the clubhouse was going to be here. It's the high ground. Uh, this is where the control center was for the Nike missile sites, where the red telephone was, yeah. where the button was, where you know, all that yeah. stuff. Oh, I didn't yeah, yeah right around here, the clubhouse and the parking were, where I those operations. When, when I read your article, I, t I took it from um, what is, uh, one of the holes, uh, like number seven. seven that's where eight. the missiles were. Okay. So the control yeah. area was up here. And so we actually, where the missiles were housed and where the command center was were two different places. Right. Okay. Yeah. And when we were building that third hole, there are a lot of interesting stories about the building of this place. But when we were building the third hole over there, it was one of the few holes, because it's, it's a long uphill par four, as you know. It had a little bit of a, the natural land had a little bit of a crease right in the landing area. So just to get visibility, you know, we had to cut that a little bit. We probably made a six or eight foot cut in there. One of the few places out here, we actually moved a little bit of dirt and we uncovered tunnels. <laughs> and nobody had the falls to go in them. <laughs> but, you know, there, there were tunnels. So it seemed to me that the conclusion we all made was it was the connection between sure the missile facility and, and the control facility versus some sort of escape tunnels for yeah, the, yeah. For for the sure. prisoners. Yeah. But I wonder, I'm sure a prisoner or two may have happened upon it at one point. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, well, I mean, you know, even you know, even in the in the in the '90s, it, it wasn't uncommon for them to have, you know, 60, 70, 80 escapes, prison escapes, every year, really? from here. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the, <laughs> one of the, I'd funny... imagine I had a working farm right? yeah. outside all day, as opposed to being locked mm -hmm. in a well, cell. That well, there, there was a maximum security way. element of this prison that sure. was here, but there was also a medium security element of it too. But there was also a lot of rumors of corrupt guards and so oh, forth yeah. too. So, <laughs> you Absolutely. know, a little turn your back and, uh, oh, <laughs> Stevie's gone. <laughs> uh, he wasn't a very hard worker anyways. We'll let him go. Um, so, so you, so you guys, you guys come up with the routing. Well, yeah, to uh, finish, to finish that. Yeah. Um, so you start with the clubhouse and you kind of work from there. You yeah. got to have your starting and finishing holes. 
you know, when, when you get into private clubs, you can, a little, you're playing by a little different set of rules. But when you have a public municipally owned golf course like this, you know, you have to accommodate everybody. You're only going to have so much of an operating budget and, and so forth. So you have to really constrain yourself you know, from an architect's perspective in that regard. But what, what, what about the fact that it was also, um, you know, you're being hired essentially by a municipality? I, I would imagine there's even more constraints than a private owner, whether it be a, a daily fee or, or, or country club or something. But mm -hmm. a, a municipality and bureaucracy that uh, generally comes along with that. I mean, there's a lot of uh, extra paperwork and, and I was going to say layers of approval, but, you know, you work at the top echelon private clubs and... That's probably the most layers of approval you have to go through. So they, they for the most part, they kind of cut us was loose. It, okay, they were, they were. Did they have yeah. any like specific asks? No, and they, and and they didn't. You know, they weren't critiquing our work as we were going along. They were just waiting for for the plan to show up. So after we worked through the routing, and actually midway through the routing, because of all these constraints, it's not just the environmentally sensitive areas, but there are a lot of steep slopes out here. You know, just a lot of areas where we didn't necessarily want to get into because it would have destroyed the the natural environment more than than we wanted to. Um, I think it's always important that golf and nature coexist sure. and, and work together. It's not, you know, when you look out, you should see nature and then you should see the golf holes versus, you know, like we all saw at Whistling Straits the other day in the Ryder <laughs> Cup, you see the golf first and then you start to go blind. Um, so you're working through the routings and because of those constraints, the, where the fifth hole and sixth hole are right now wasn't part of the original property we had to work with. So we had where the area where three, yeah. four and seven are, but we didn't have five and six. and. What happened was our fifth, original. Fifth is, so fifth is the par five that kind of curves right. Right, the and then six is the long. So the okay, two yeah. parallel holes going back and forth, yep. um, and a couple of dozen acres out there. So the limit that wasn't part of the original. Wasn't project. part of the original land that Bill and I had to work with. So you look at our original routings, and we crossed Giles Run, the main stream that bisects the property. Okay. We crossed that four times in our original routing, or all of our original routings, and the county came back to us and said, "No, it's too sensitive because of a tree clearing issue." we could only cross it twice. So we looked at it and really discovered, all right, if you want to accomplish all of your goals, if you want a flagship championship golf course, because remember Fairfax County Park Authority, they own you know, about eight golf courses, eight or nine golf courses. So they wanted a real true flagship mm -hmm. yeah. and something that was not just going to be their premier facility in their portfolio of golf courses, but something that truly was going to be a model for municipal golf across the country. And I think we you know, realized some tremendous success in that regard. Had think, you guys designed a course from scratch at that point? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Bill's done a number of courses in, in his career. Um, and we had just wrapped up, right around that time, we were wrapping up one in Pennsylvania, one in Harrisonburg, Virginia, okay. one in Richmond, Virginia. Um, so we went back to them and said, look, if you want to accomplish these goals, we need a little bit more property. You know, if we can only cross Giles Run twice, we need some more land. And because, you know, again, it's a few thousand acres to work with, you know, they uh, they gave it to us pretty pretty easily, and it, and it and it was a real kind of game changer. It allowed us to stretch the course out a little bit more and spread it out more, um, and, and utilize that's more of the property. Rare in a, in a, in a course oh, no question. And and the way five and six sit on that ground, we moved barely any dirt out there. Yeah, yeah. You know, five's the landing area. Five is not ideally what we would want. It's yeah. it's it's good. It's a nice plateaued landing area, but then it falls off. And the reason for that, we would have graded a little bit differently, but there's a massive water line that goes through there. So things like that, you're always fighting constraints like that. There's another water, I mean, it goes through the whole property. So it goes through the front of 10T and, and yeah. over there. So things like that, you have to mitigate that stream that crosses five. You know, we can only pipe so many streams out here. When you're dealing with public golf, a lot of, a lot of older folks, a lot of juniors, you're always thinking about playability and getting those folks around the golf course and you build demand carries and do it left and right and you're just going to have a problem you know so was was the county's goal even you know when they hired you guys that, that you know we we want to host usga events for example well we actually specifically tarred before we moved a shovel full of dirt out here we were eyeing the public links that was and that came from from bill and i that was you know something that that we we knew what that tournament was all about they they seek golf courses like this and we set that as a goal and we achieved it public links was here in 2013. Yeah, i remember when i interviewed bill and brian for the golfer's journal article the very one of the first things that we sort of talked about there was that bill bill was very clear that the county wanted a championship level golf course they did not just want kind of another run of the mill mm -hmm. muni um and both of them sort of targeted that usga public links and and that was the sort of, you know, that was the finish line. Um, and to get there and the way that they did was pretty extraordinary. Right. And, and early on, I mean, the, the, this place, I'm not sure where it is now. I don't, I, I you know, I 
take ratings with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of BS behind them. But, you know, this was a top 10 municipal course for a while, for as long yeah. as I can remember. Yeah, and when yeah. you think, when you start, I think, oh, well, okay. But you start to think about what else is on that list. Yeah. Beth Blade Black, yeah. you know, Torrey Chambers Pines. Bay, Torrey Pines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a pretty, it's a pretty exclusive list, and including a bunch of U.S. Open venues. For folks that, that don't know, because the, the U.S. Publix is not around anymore, unfortunately. Correct. What, what, what is the U.S. Publix? The, the Public Links was the peak amateur tournament. And the reason it kind of went by the wayside is originally the rules were you couldn't be a member. a member of a private club but so it just ended up being the collegiate tournament every year the top college players would win it every year including including here yeah. like the two guys who played in the final match are both on tour right now yeah. um so that's kind of why it went Is by the right? wayside who, the, who those two are really? um jordan, jordan Nibrugi Nibrugi. And michael Kim. yep yep wow yeah do you remember what the course played at what yardage that for that tournament I'm not sure. I, remember, I, didn't, I wanted to come out. I didn't make yeah. it, but, but I they, remember hearing some stories. Well, there's a few that. interesting bits about that tournament. They, they, they changed it up from day to day. I don't know what it was for that final match, but, you know, like the fifth hole, for instance, they played it as a par. They moved the tees up a little bit, played it as a par four instead of a par five. But a monster par four. Monster, monster. par four, but yeah. both of those guys hit three or four iron for their second shot and both made birdie, yeah. which is an eagle. I mean, yeah. it's yeah. so... That was both, a great final match. Both made eagle to have for, the hole. To come down to the 18th <laughs> hole, which is a gambling, you know, par five as well. And I mean, the, the classic. That green on number five with a four iron. I mean, that's yeah. not a deep green. No. I mean, it's deep if you look at it from that well, way. But from yeah. that not end. only that, but it's all carry. I mean, yeah. if you're trying to get, if, you, if you're playing a second shot and then your third in, yeah. it's, it's relatively open. But if you're trying to get to green in two, you're, it's all carry over a massive sand bunker. So yeah. it was, and it's a terrace green. I mean, yeah. both of those guys, it was, there's a reason they're both on tour yeah. now. There's a yeah. reason they, they, you know, we're the U.S. amateur yeah. champion and, you know, so forth and so on. So that's unfortunately why it went by the wayside is it just got taken over by those top college, yeah. right. you know, players. So it was replaced by the by the amateur four ball, which I think is also a good tournament. Yeah. Um, um, Josh, when did you uh, kind of get the notion to write the article that you did in, in the history yeah. of Laurel Hill? You know, I, I'd come out here and, and played a handful of times and and really enjoyed the golf course and I'm a kind of a history nerd so um, uh, I had just sort of started digging into the sort of the history of this place on my own just because I was curious and you know that's one of the things that is really really cool and unique about this place specifically is you know I walk when I play and so I you know you tend to see things on the golf course walking that you may not see if you're following a cart path yeah. um, and some of the things that you'll see out here are these great signs that the county put up that sort of explain the history uh, of the place to you so sure. you know if you've ever been to like Philadelphia or down in DC or wherever it is you know you see you see those signs that are like posted outside of sure. monuments like yeah. I'm the guy that stops and reads the sign <laughs> right like you know my wife gets super frustrated like I read every word sure. uh, but I'm that way and so out here you see these great these, these signs that are up that it's almost like you're in a historical park um, and it really piqued my interest. You know, I read about the Nike missile site. I read about the women's suffrage movement uh, event that happened here uh, in the prison. And I just started digging into it. And um, did you have the idea? Let me ask you. Yeah. Let me ask you it a different way. Yeah. Did you have the idea for the article before the Golfers Journal existed, or or the Golfers Journal, which is a really cool yeah. publication? Once that came out, you started to the wheels started turning. And said this would be a great publication for a story on Laurel. It was a little bit of both. So like I'm, I, I do some work with Link Soul. Uh, Link Soul happens to be one of the, the the founding sort of partners of the Golfers Journal. Yeah. Um, Take this opportunity as as you yeah. as you answer this to talk about your relationship <laughs> with Link Soul. Yeah. So um, so I, I I do some advising for Link Soul uh, specifically on their military and veterans engagement uh, and their sort of charity work that they do. Link Soul has slowly taken over my wardrobe. <laughs> I'm, I'm wearing a Link Soul shirt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Me too. So and, and the, uh, the owner of Link or the founder of Link Soul. Yeah. John Ashworth. John Ashworth and and Jeff Cunningham. Uh, who is his nep nephew. So, of course, John was the founder of Ashworth Golf, uh, which was huge in the in the late 80s and early 90s. You know, Freddie Couples and Ernie Els and, and all these guys. Tiger wore it when he was an amateur. Um, uh, John Soul ended up selling that, and then years later he and Jeff uh, founded Link Soul. Uh, they're based out of Southern California. It's a very cool sort of like beach golf chill you know it's not a golf uniform it's kind of sure. you know, transitions from yep. the golf course to like you can 
you know, where to work if, uh, if you want. Um, but, so you were connected with them yeah. prior to... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Yeah, pr prior to that, uh, prior to the Golf Journal, Golfers Journal even existing. Uh, but once wow. Golfers Journal started... How did you get connected with Link's Golf? Um, so I, just, I don't know. Somehow I, I started getting their catalogs in my mailbox uh, at home. <laughs> Um, and Maybe you subscribed to Ashworth. I, yeah, they, I don't know. Kind of I don't know what it was, but it started just showing up. Um, you know, everybody gets catalogs, and you're like, "How? Do, I never signed up for this. How did I get this?" Um, but it started showing up, and I, my two years in, in the Marine Corps, I was stationed in San Diego, and I lived on Mission Beach. Uh, I was stationed at Marine Corps Air Station Miramar, and so that like beach vibe mm -hmm. really resonated with me sure. um but and then the golf aspect of it was like wow this is like too good to be true right and then the, and then the clothes were were did my this, style did link so. soul have any kind of military connection at all they didn't point? so you know I, I reached out to them and i just said look i love what you guys are doing like i know you're west coast but to the extent you ever have anything going on on the east coast i'd be happy to help you out mm -hmm. you know never expected a response in any way the next day, Johnny Ashworth emailed me directly, and he said, hey, I got your note. Thank you so much. I shared it with my entire team. You really inspired us and motivated us. Oh, by the way, <laughs> we've been trying to identify a military-related nonprofit to donate some money to. Um, can you help us? Uh, so that, you know, the relationship really started organically like that um, and seemingly like, like, like all the best relationships do. Um, and so I started working with them and, you know, one thing led to another and we started doing other projects and, you know, now they donate 10% of their proceeds from their make par, not war line to military related charities, uh, including one that, that is very close to my heart uh, called Warrior Canine Connection, yeah. uh, which raises and trains service dogs that are donated to, to disabled veterans and veterans in need. And you can find um, uh, a lot of that information, including including your your smiling face yeah. on their on their website. Yeah, on, on linksoul.com. <laughs> uh, you, you can find that story and anything that you, you buy with a make par not war sort of slogan or logo on it go you know, uh, portions of the proceeds go to military nonprofits. But so that relationship kind of organically led me to like, wow, I was like, you know what, I've got this this great story idea mm -hmm. of Laurel Hill. I think the golfers journal, they're sort of long form, commercially quiet, you know, beautiful photography. Um, I think that's kind of the right platform for this story because this is not something you're going to see in Golf Digest or, right. or Golf Magazine, and I'm not knocking them in that way. They have their 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 segment and their audience that they're looking for, but this is not a how to hit hit it ten yards further story. Sure. Or this is not the new equipment you should buy yeah. story. Like this is this is history and this is architecture, and yeah. um, so. I just thought it was a great platform, and I reached out to Jeff, and I said, I've got this story. Can you connect me with, you know, the, the publisher of Golfer's Journal, Brendan Thomas, um, and Travis Hill, um, who's the editor? And they did, and I pitched it to them, and they loved it, and they, they sent me on my way. And so during during the research for that article, you interviewed... Yeah, I did. So that's why I, I first I first met Brian. Um, you interviewed Brian and Bill together yep. or separate? Or? I interviewed Brian and Bill together. Uh, the very first question I asked them was, who was the asshole that put the bunker on three? Uh, it was Bill. Bill. <laughs> right, which is right in the middle of fairway. Yeah. I've never been in it. Hardest par yeah. I aim for it every time I've ever been in it. <laughs> yeah, there is a... Uh, it's about the size I, of this table. I was going to say, I don't think I've ever been in it. I'm, I'm in. <laughs> you aim for it. You're guaranteed there not to go in it. You know, Stevie doesn't have the yardage to get to it. Uh, <laughs> the way that course, that, yeah. that hole is set up, it kind of, it, yeah. mentally, it may, kind of makes you swing out of your shoes, which makes me usually go short. That is well, such a great hole. That's the brilliance of the hole, right? That it's visually intimidating, but it, like as a, as a practical matter, it normally doesn't come into play. I love what people um, fish about that hole. I love it. It's an absolute <laughs> great hole. Um, but uh, yeah, so I interviewed them and got some great, you know, historical perspective on it and sort of got inside their head as to their, their process and choices that they architectural choices that they were making here which was great um i came here uh to laurel hill and i interviewed uh the gm ryan carmen and then uh the director of golf at the time um and sort of got their perspective of like you know what's it like today yeah. and their the you know the, the pieces that they could add so I sat down with a former warden of the prison. I took a oh, tour wow. of the prison with the, the development group that was doing the renovation. And 
I spent many, many hours um, at the Fairfax County Public Library researching. Um, I went down to the National Archives and got a bunch of you stuff. You put some so real elbow grease in there. I house. did, you know. Like, it was important to me to, yeah. to get it right yeah. um, and talk to all the people that, you know, that, that deserve to have a voice in that story. When did the two of you start playing golf, guys? Shortly Almost after that, <laughs> as soon as he walked into my office, I realized oh, this guy's going to be easy to get some money off of. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have the mental game to keep up. So. It still hasn't happened. He's actually never beaten me, ever. Uh, You're always throwing drinks in, in my direction. <laughs> That's another story. I've, I've not. I've played with Josh. I've not played with you, Brian. But Josh has told me that you're 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 a riot to to play with. But yeah, we we, well, we started playing immediately. I mean, Steve and I we. We see eye to eye on just about everything, if not everything, related to golf. Mm -hmm. Just and and I don't think I can say that about too many other people that I've met. I mean, we're just totally on the same page about everything. Um, I don't know if we're progressive or traditionalist. Yeah. Maybe a little a mixture little of both. Yeah. You know, as I my my favorite thing to say is, golf is about what happens in between shots more than anything else. You know, the the fact that. You know, like shooting pool or, or playing cards or whatever, the activity that's going on in the background to me is secondary to just being out in nature, getting some recreation, throwing, having some laughs, whether it's with sure. close friends or total strangers that yeah. you just happen to get, get paired with that day. Yeah. I mean, to me, that's, that's really what, what golf is all about, is all the other stuff that's kind of going, or going on at the same time, the, the health and the recreational side of things, the social side of things, the nature side of things. Right. And the fact that you're just knocking a little white ball around in, in the, once in a while is, yeah. you know, it's great. But to me, that's, that's, that's less than, than the bigger picture of, of what you're actually doing and why you're out there. Well, cheers to that. I mean, I, I, was, I, I couldn't agree with Anything you just said anymore, I, I, I'm, on, I'm, on, I'm on the same page there. Let, 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 let's talk a bit, of, now, now we'll kind of go all over the place. Like yep. what, what's, what's going on these days? So you guys are both kind of, you know, get different um, projects and passions going on. Brian, and so you mentioned it earlier, uh, you're no longer in the D.C. area. Correct. Bill Love is retired. You essentially took over the firm and uh, fled, fled the Bellway. Couldn't flee fast enough. <laughs> Couldn't pack my bags fast enough. You had, you had, you had enough of 495 traffic and uh, the rat race, and you're out in uh, the mountains of Nevada. Ah, uh, yeah, I had enough of Washington D.C. about 15 years ago, <laughs> and couldn't wait to move out west. I, I, it's... That doesn't jive with the theme of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I mean, I, this I is got, the Beltway. I got very fortunate to to hook up with Bill Love. Uh, I will put the work he and I've done up against anybody. He is a true practitioner a true professional um I, I wouldn't have wanted to learn this business from anyone else you know i i had some other opportunities to leave and and go to you know maybe some more well-known firms at various points in my career and and i made the decision not to because i was getting way more opportunity with bill i mean he really cut me loose he, he recognized my passion and and you know my talent certainly um so you know i didn't see you know, as any other opportunity is better, even though in my mind, before I got into the business, I'm thinking, this is going to be great. I'm going to design golf courses in the Caribbean and in Europe and all over the world. And this is going to be awesome. And it doesn't quite work out that way. It ends up being almost all renovation work, of course. What's the future of your firm? So now yeah, you, you've told me, you know, before we, I, I follow you on social media. I've seen you do some work recently in, I think, Mexico and in right. Southern California. So my, you, you know, my plan was always to move to the mountains. I'm an outdoor guy. I'm a big skier. The project you're referencing down in, in Mexico is a project we wrapped up, uh, arguably the top club in Mexico, Club Campestre, Monterey. I've uh, been there for a while. It's 27 holes right in the middle of the city in Monterey, which is about an hour from Texas. It's inland. It's one of the inland city. And just high end, high end, high end. That's club. the demographic that listens to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that, that's just it, you know. And, and, and I've been in Washington D.C. all week for the exact opposite, for for you know public golf courses that are very affordable and, and accommodate older folks and juniors and so forth. So you know, as a golf architect, you're always spanning that spectrum. I guess maybe not everybody. We we have. Sure. And just like you know, work, working at the Olympic Club for 20 years in San Francisco, when you work at those high end clubs. Um, you know, you, you got a little extra money to work with. You, you can design stuff that you're not worried about having them maintain. You know, you have a lot more flexibility than a course like Laurel Hill where we couldn't do crazy bunkering and, and you know, we couldn't get carried away and from an architectural standpoint. You have to keep it very, very maintainable, very accessible, very playable. 
Um, but when you get into higher end private clubs, especially when they have multiple courses like this one in Mexico or like the Olympic Club, you know, you can have a, you can have a lot more fun. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you, you touched on, uh, or at least off camera, a, a couple projects, even though you've moved uh, your operations out to the West Coast. Uh, I don't know if there's anything you can share on, you, you've mentioned a, a, a big project you're working on in Southern Virginia or, or wh whereabouts? It's about an hour west of Richmond. It's called the Golf Club at Foster's Farm. Uh, it's been a long time in, in the works, but it's very high end. Invitation only, very exclusive private club. We've got a thousand acres down there. The golf course sits on about 500 of those acres. There are 200. Compare that to how many acres is Laurel Hill on? Laurel Hill sits on 310, 315, something so like that. It's a huge property. It's massive. It, I don't think there, I can't think of a golf course that's stretched out and is spaced out as much as this one is. You can fit, you can't see other golf holes. I mean, it's not built yet, but the way it's designed, you can't see other golf holes from whatever hole you're playing. There are no houses. There, there are no schools. There are no, there's going to be no golf car path. The only thing you're going to see on, it, on any given hole is nature and the hole that you're playing. So, you know, this, this is great. I mean, the land is perfect. It's, it's massive, it is perf that perfect, so, I mean, look at the, what Laurel Hill sits on here. It's got this really nice roll, there's, there's lakes, there's streams, there's nice trees. It is this on steroids. There are holes that have 45 feet of elevation change in them, but you know, it's gonna be walkable, it's gonna be playable, it's, it's not gonna have to move a lot of dirt. I, I can't. Where, where are you in the, in the, where is the project in the- We're project? about to break ground. We're about to start clearing the trees uh, within a matter of weeks and I'll be shaping golf holes if all goes as planned, uh, probably by the beginning of November. Is this, for, is this for Kinlock members that are getting tired of Kinlock or what? Well, it's interesting. <laughs> I mean, my, my client is a member at, at Kinlock and Kinlock is, if you've never been to Kinlock. I have not. It is an experience in terms of customer service that's second to none. You get treated like an absolute king there, an absolute king. I mean, when you're playing and you want a drink, the caddy makes a phone call and a drink shows up by the time you get to the Air green. service, right. yeah. I mean, it is that. <laughs> but the golf course, even though it's immaculate, yeah, it's just a golf course. Sure. There's nothing particularly, you know, unique or, or outstanding about the golf course, in my opinion. Um, so we're going to have that same level or higher level of customer service at this club. And it's not too far from Kinlock. It's, you know, 45 minutes maybe from, from Kinlock. But with a golf course that I'm here to tell you right now is going to be as good as anything. I have more general questions like like so it's so like a club like that right so how how does how do you get that how do you get that gig essentially like is this is this I got like, lucky it fell into my lap just the relationship <laughs> well, that you made over the course of the years like how do, how do they find no, I mean, Brian get, Kington? getting work in this business is extremely difficult uh, a lot of it is word of mouth a lot of it is repeat business this particular case uh, my client is a local guy to Washington DC his his family is from Amelia County where the golf course is. So the golf course actually sits on, um, you know, that, that's how the, the site started with a bunch of his family land who are longtime farmers, been there for generations in that part of Virginia. But he's a local guy here in DC. So he, he just walked into the office and this was, you know, over 20 years ago when Bill laid out the first design. Um, so since Bill retired, the project has become mine, which is great. And, and once I get going, I'm, I'm really not going to do much other work, take on much other work, because I'm going to be there almost every day on site. I'm going to shape a lot of it myself. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's really going to take a massive amount of time. It's a colossal project. There's, just, there's a couple of miles of stream channels that need to be shaped. You know, think Shadow Creek. Yeah. Um, there, there's, there's a half a mile of stone walls that need to be built. You know, it's, it's a massive project. There's a whole par three golf course. It, you know, the world's greatest driving. We've got a driving range that's a giant bowl that's 400 yards across. You can have a tee all the way around it, wow. you know, play at any times of the day and, and so forth. So I got fortunate in that regard. That, that type of club that's going to seek uh, big time tournaments or just stay no, super No, it is. Yes, more, more exactly. Like the... um, I, I, might, I might try and convince my client to let me run one event in there when we first open, just so you might that's, get that's, an, all, you that's all for selfish right reasons. You might get an invite. That's all for selfish <laughs> reasons. But the first name on the membership list is Michael Jordan, and it goes from there. It's all Hall of Famers and, and high net worth individuals, a lot of investment bankers, just a lot of very successful business people and, yeah. and that kind of thing. There are now Bruce Smith is a member. There, there are a number of, of high profile athletes and, and other guy, folks. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> Got a great well, golf swing. 
let's go uh, just do the 180 of that. So now, so now back to municipal public. You guys touched on was this? this, this I, I think this would be brand new information to me because I haven't heard anything about it. But that there might be a, a short course coming here. There are some rumors that yeah. <laughs> that Kington laid out a, a short course here at Laurel Hill. Um, Whenever he starts talking about himself in the third person, you know you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, you know. I've done a lot of work with Fairfax County Park Authority because they've got a bunch of golf courses. In fact, that's why I'm all muddy. That's where I was this morning at another one of their golf courses, renovating some bunkers. Um, but they're great clients, and, and they, they understand that you need to grow or die. You need to invest in your facilities. You need to make those, even though they might take a lot of, um, a lot of guts <laughs> when you're dealing with the public sector and, and you know, making a bad decision for some of those guys, they, they understand the value of, of making those necessary periodic capital investments in, in all of their facilities. So they're constantly making upgrades. They're constantly doing what you should do in the golf business, what, what nine out of 10 owners and operators I think don't do, which is look more than 10, year, 10 years into the future. And while they have a very successful portfolio of golf courses, you know, you always want to look at accommodating more people, bringing more people to your facilities, getting on the front end of trends and, and protecting yourself so that you're going to be sustainable for, for the long term. And so I had actually been thinking about, since we were building this golf course 15, 16 years ago when we were building the golf course, there's a piece of land to the right of hole number six up there, which is kind of vacant. And I had always envisioned that as a short course, and I'm not the only one. And then a couple of years ago, I got a call from Ryan, the, the manager here, and he had been talking to Rick, the superintendent, and a few other people, and they had, they said, we've got an idea for a short course. I said, so do I. <laughs> yeah, but they were thinking about a different piece of land. you standing on 6T, looking out towards the fairway, like kind of towards your left? To the left, yeah. So there's a whole bunch of room in there, which I think is being, I've heard, has, has always been slated for uh, additional athletic fields, uh, which is fine. And, and when I got the call from the course here, they were looking at this property on the other side of the lake here, on the opposite of 16, mm -hmm. which I hadn't considered in the past for a short course but it, it it's it's a great piece of property it's not nearly as big as the piece of land to the left of six but it's yeah. about 13 and a half acres and it's you don't you don't run into more holes going that direction no yeah okay. yeah there's so some, past the pump house there is yeah. nothing but nature i mean you can yeah. see the way the land moves over there you yeah. can see the access to the water you can see the access to the views yeah. uh yeah. you know it's close to to one T to to yeah. to nine green to sixteen T. Right. I mean, well, and that's the thing because one T is is separated from the clubhouse. You know, it would be in close proximity to where the short course would start. So, looking at that hillside over there, when we built the golf course, we dredged this lake and scraped up clay out of that hillside to line the lake with. So that whole area from the lake all the way to the road was clear cut and disturbed during construction. Meaning that now, fifteen years later, even though it looks like it's all wooded to us, that's all. 15 years or less growth years over there yeah. so there's no significant trees over there there's yeah. nothing that's going to be a a regulatory restriction or anything it's it's just 13 and a half acres of very underutilized land right now yeah so yeah, they, they I mean, saw that as well you know we've got this land and we've got already this wonderfully successful facility it's got a first tee program here junior golf has a big presence here you know so we've laid out a short course that's about 700 yards maybe a little bit longer than the cradle you know some of some of the other short courses that are out there but it it'll accommodate juniors but you know us yeah. we can go out there and go around it five times and not get bored because yeah. we've got an opportunity there to my point earlier about how i really needed to behave myself when i was doing the architecture out here <laughs> <laughs> i don't need to behave myself at all we can build a bunch of waste bunkers that aren't going to take a lot of maintenance because you rake them once a week or whatever you'll have no bunker rakes let them play as waste areas you know bermuda grass that just the tees are the beginning of the fairway no tee boxes just very naturalized almost yeah. i hate to use the word Irish lynx because there's no such thing as lynx land in the United States, um, contrary to what some people think. But it's going to have that kind of character where it's where, where the nature encroaches onto the golf features, which you just can't do on, on the big course like this because you just don't have the maintenance for it and and you don't want to you don't want that pace of play liability. So you, so you're, the the way you're talking about this, it sounds like this is can we say this is happening or is it or is no. it, that that's that's still a long, it is still a long way to go. It's likely to happen. It's on, but, it's on, it's on a good trajectory. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, with, yeah. with Fairfax County Park Authority, you know, they've, they've got a, they, don't, they own golf courses, they own rec centers, they own a bunch of assets. And, you know, of course, Laurel Hill is just one of them, you know, and, and when you get into funding and, you know, it's public sector, so a lot of it's funded with bonds and so forth. Those are on five-year cycles and so forth. So 
right now, you know, there's, there's some pretty good support behind it, but you know, it's, we're not officially, I don't have a contract. I mean, we're not, we're not up and running quite yet, but there's definitely a lot of support behind it. Um, we put together a very elaborate, you know, document, written document that got into market analysis and financial analysis. And, and I think the whole point here is that this day and age, golf was certainly on a downward trajectory for a number of years, but as of about five years ago, it started on a pretty pronounced upswing. And I don't, every golf course from top private clubs and the strength of their membership and the, the size of their wait list and on all, all the way down to the lowest struggling municipally owned golf course, you know, rounds are up and, and golf has made this swing, made this upswing. COVID, as much as that fucked up the rest of the world, you know, it was the best thing that could possibly happen to golf. It, it took that already upswing and supercharged it. And, you know, even though courses were closed for a couple of months last year, they all made their nut back by the end of the summer. And, and, it, and it brought newer people into the game. It brought people who left back into the game. People who were already playing the game were playing more. You know, golf was one of the few things that people could do within all these other restrictions that were going on. So I think that taking advantage of not just that upswing, that general upswing in golf, but just this trend that's also been occurring during a similar timeline, which is getting away from 18 hole golf courses, which essentially eat up your entire day to play. So yeah. shrinking 18 hole golf courses down, building new nine hole golf courses, short courses, uh, elaborate short game practice facilities with maybe some practice holes, big putting greens with putting courses, you know, yeah. looking at alternative golf facilities that don't cost as much and maybe most importantly over anything else don't take as much time to play yeah. you know and i think that is a and one thing that that stevie and i see eye on and and talked about this early on and knowing each other is that you know there there aren't these rules you yeah. know that you don't you don't have to have 18 holes you don't you know and and you can do all these alternative ideas whether it's uh we were talking about belmont earlier which mm -hmm. reduced themselves from 18 down to 12 and and did it right said well we've got we've got a couple of issues we've got some tight holes we've got some dog holes we've got all these great holes let's keep the great holes and let's build in some alternative facilities in here are you starting to see um like one of the first times josh and i ever played uh here i remember mm -hmm. we played we played the front nine oh i don't know at least five years ago yeah but you had just gotten i was i i, I still Gosh, I'm not embarrassed to admit this, but I still haven't made it to Sweetens Cove. I've been, oh. I've been planning on getting there for like forever. Yeah. But that, that I was aware of it at the time, but you had just gotten back to sure. Sweetens yeah. Cove. Sweetens Cove um, is, is one of many, but it's almost like on the forefront of kind yeah. of what you're talking about. And, yep. and it's like, it's not really near any major metropolitan centers. Mm -hmm. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere. And it, yeah. it's, it's not 18 holes. I mean, it's still nine, but it, it's, it's a little unorthodox. Well, Brian and I went there together. Um, yeah, times, yeah. and um you know we got to know rob collins the architect really well and um and and the guys uh like patrick boyd that were sort of you know uh that partnered on that project and you know brian and i've done a lot of traveling together and it's sort of seeing these places for yourself right walking the land uh talking to the people that that were responsible for those places and um that you know it, it all, all of those little pieces, I feel like, end up sort of shaping who you are, like as an individual and as a professional, and um, and you can see how um, you know how Rob was influenced by Mike Strantz and his sure. work, um, and and you know uh, the many great architects and courses that Brian has had a privilege to work at that have sort of influenced him and sure. helped sort of shape his eye. And Sweetens is that way, and you can so I think you can sort of see how Sweetens has the ripple effect. Well, what's Sweetens. also interesting yeah. about Sweetens, I mean, I'm, I'm very well familiar with, yeah. with this whole story, even though I've never been there, but is that Sweetens was open for several years before yeah. the public really outside of mm -hmm. the immediate uh, surrounding yep. area in Tennessee caught wind of it. And yeah. now it's like unbelievably well. Like, I went was... out to be the beginning of this year to try to get tea time. Yeah, and you, couldn't, you, can't. you couldn't do it. Yeah. And even though he's selling like all day yeah. packages. And I know that Rob Collins and his group, they've got yeah. some other probably one up in upstate New York and yeah. land Nebraska. Nebraska. Yeah. But I'm almost curious yeah. for the for the both of you, because I, I know, you know, Josh, you're kind of a, a golf course architecture mm -hmm. aficionado and, and good golf course aficionado at this yeah. point. And, and, and you're obviously in the Brian business. Brian's a professional. You're yeah. obviously <laughs> in the business. But I'm curious, like, because of Sweetens Cove, mm -hmm. Sweetens, Sweetens Cove's success and popularity, yeah. are you starting, is, is, is the industry caught up, or other people, other developers, people with money are saying, this is what we need to build. Let's, well, let's I want to, I want to hear like Brian's, like, you know, the professional piece of this, but kind <laughs> of like the, 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 um, 
you know, my side of it as sort of not being in the industry and sort of being an observer. Mm -hmm. In my opinion is, I think what Sweetens Cove did, that New York Times article really brought them into the, 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 the focus of the general public. That is what put them on the map. And Rob will tell you that. Uh, Patrick will tell you that. Um, and it, it introduced that golf course and then, by extension, their model to the country. And, and people now travel from all over to South Pittsburgh, Tennessee, uh, which there is absolutely nothing there. Nope, no place to eat. <laughs> yeah. Best nachos well, you, in you Tennessee. You on social media, like uh, the Manning brothers are playing yeah. there. I mean, there's like Dude, celebrities are playing It's there. incredible. And, 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 and again, you can't get a, well, you can't you get can't a tea, get time, a tea time. But like, I think what that place did more than anything is it, is, is it, it provided a proof source. It provided a proof source to the rest of the industry that, like, these ideas that folks may have had before that, like, that, that wasn't a new concept. Sure. I, I just it don't think... the concept. I, I think it proved it, and, and, and it did it in a very public way. And I think it... Guys like Brian and Bill and other great architects that have sort of wanted to do this thing for a long time now can point to something yeah. that that was just sort of an overwhelming success. And that's my kind of my question for Brian is are you starting to see that from the the people that traditionally have money and back these sort of projects? Are they starting to see it was like, oh wait, Sweden's Cove, like I I don't know the details around this, but imagine it's like probably a less expensive piece of land and that people can now look at places that traditionally be like, yeah. you know, I don't want to invest there. It's like three hours from anything. Yeah. And now they're starting to see, well wait a second, if you build it they will come. Yep. Destination golf. The thing about Sweetens. <laughs> <laughs> what? Here we go. I love it. We had an absolutely epic time at Sweetens, so uh, I'll let Brian take it away. I mean, I don't. I like Sweetens a lot. I, I think I don't think they reinvented anything. Um, but taking, I think, I think what they did is going to be a lot of the future of golf development, which, in, in other words, taking a course that already exists that is kind of boring, kind of mundane, old, whatever, and just rebuilding it as something spectacular versus taking a new piece of land and all the challenges that come with that, permitting challenges, perhaps rezoning challenges, tree removal challenges, all those challenges that you can, you're already grandfathered in if you're just taking an existing golf course and rebuilding it and making far better tees, far better sand bunkers, and far better greens. And I think that's what Sweeten's accomplished. You know, all, all it is, at least common denominator of it is, it was an existing nine-hole golf course that was built into a new nine-hole golf course. You know, that's really all it is with the big missing piece of, it's a fabulous piece of architecture. And, and I think it proves the point that there's a lot of very amateur architecture that is out there and has always been out there. I think Donald Ross is the most overrated architect ever lived. I think his work hey, is oh, take a boring, 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 <laughs> boring. And I'm from New England. I've played, you know, I've played proper Donald Ross golf courses. I'm still waiting for somebody to tell me how he managed to build 227 golf courses in the 1920s when he could only get around by train. But the point is, <laughs> it's like a restaurant. People say, well, it's about location. It's about location. It's about location. Well, bullshit. Bullshit on that. If you have great food, you will have a successful restaurant. It doesn't matter where your location is. They will find you. And I think the same Are thing Are you suggesting Donald Ross was like a modern-day celebrity chef? Just no, I think Donald Ross is a modern-day <laughs> subway. Or... <laughs> the point is, is just like my comparison to the restaurants, if you have an exceptional chef who's producing exceptional food, you're going to have an exceptional restaurant. And if you have exceptional architecture, people will come to find it, even if you are in the middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. Virginia, or the middle of nowhere in South Pittsburgh, Tennessee. Yep. You know, and that's what that is. It's, it's, it's different. It's, it's, it's on the cutting edge of, of, of architecture. I mean, Rob didn't do anything that, that, you know, some other architects haven't done elsewhere in terms of that style of architecture, but bringing it to that part of the country and, and taking something that was so lackluster and turning it into something that, you can go around it as many times as you want, and yep. you're gonna, you're gonna, you're still gonna have fun. And I think that's, that's the whole point is that, you know, there just isn't that much extraordinary architecture out there, in my opinion. And some of that is because, as I was saying before, you're limited, mm -hmm. in what you can do. Um, but I think Sweetens is maintained by five guys in a very modest budget. You know, it's it's well, great. That's what seems to be the yeah. exciting thing. I mean, there's there's so many golf courses that are. 
I guess, and that's a better way to put it, that are that already exist, yep. right. that are pretty mundane, that aren't near anything. But now, because that model's, you know, kind of proven a little bit that, mm-hmm. that people might be willing to go in there and make it something special. Well, and I also think they embraced this sort of modern approach to the game where it's like, you know what? We don't have to play 18 holes. We don't have to carry 14 clubs. We don't have to be in our golf uniform. Mm -hmm. We can bring our music. We can go barefoot. We can play with a half set. We can play eight holes. We can play 16 holes. We can go around five times. We can go around once. Uh, We can walk. Uh, You know, and and it's, I think they embrace that really, that vibe um, that really resonated with with a lot of people um, that just don't subscribe to this, you know, the sort of the country club um, yeah. sort I of think, I think nine-hole courses are extremely underrated. I, I, I mean, I grew up playing local nine-hole courses. I'm sure yep. you both did yep. as well. They, they at once upon a time were, were, I think, the backbone, that's not quite the right word, but part of the fundamental of golf, part, part of the foundation of the sport. It's, it's, that's how so many people learn. We're on their local level, even a par, I grew up on a par three course. You know, it's still to this day, one of my favorite courses to play. Yeah. All the greens are round. The architecture is terrible and boring, but I can go out there in a Celtics jersey and with a case of beer and have a great time, you know? And that's the thing, you don't need 18 holes. You, you, if, if, if it's good architecture, you know, nine holes, go around many times you put a bunch of tees out there you know some interesting yeah. greens where you're Double moving the pins. pin around a lot yeah. you just don't need that that extra nine in my opinion in a lot of cases you know it's it's half the maintenance budget it's a little more than half of the operations budget it, it's it can be just as successful as an 18 hole golf course and i think sweetens you know is a fine example of that and i, I think it's definitely a trend that is gonna going to continue to build in, in the golf industry is is embracing these alternative facilities yeah. that just aren't the standard 18 hole golf course, you know, and, and getting away from, you know, unnecessary length. So many architects are out there just getting these 73, 74, 7,500 yard golf courses. It's like every par four is a long par four. Every par three is a long par three. There are no reachable fives. You end up with this, you know, unnecessarily elongated golf course where you end up using six or seven of your clubs in your bag. Stevie only carries six or seven <laughs> clubs. So it's like three or four clubs for him, but it, it takes, it takes something out of golf. You know, golf is a golf is a sport that requires a thousand shots. Well, but what about the idea? I mean, there's there's I mean, they've been we've been building eighteen hole golf courses for for so long, and, and just because the course is eighteen holes, doesn't mean you have to play eighteen. Sure. Holes. Mm-hmm. Is there anything in golf architecture or golf course design where you can come in and renovate and say, okay, I'm going to take an existing eighteen hole course? And I don't I don't even know where I'm going with this, but like doing something. Well, to I mean, we well, yeah, something I mean, to it where you can make it. This year's a seven roll yeah. hole routing. Here's a oh, well, or hole just routing. or just taking the eighteen. This is you know I'm looking at, um, because it's it is I, I I sort of decided a couple of years ago that it's going to be easier to find investors and buy golf courses than it is to generate work in my business. So I've been pursuing a lot of that, and a lot of the facilities I'm looking at, um, are kind of following along in that that idea is taking an eighteen hole course or a twenty seven hole course and splitting it in a you know, two or three distinct nine hole courses where you really have a different character from nine holes to nine holes. And, and maybe one is more challenging than the other, or maybe they're about the same, but the point is, is a different experience, a different character versus 18 holes, which, yep. you know, when you're designing 18 holes, you, you go out of your way to make it 18 yep. holes with similar character and Well, you and look so at forth. like what we just mentioned about Belmont earlier down in Richmond, right? Yeah. Like, especially for the sort of the Beltway you know, DMV crowd that's likely listening to this podcast. I mean, getting down to Richmond is not difficult. Yeah. Um, and they just did that with Belmont, where they had an 18-hole course, uh, tilling has design, and they recognized, you know what, the best way forward here is to reduce the golf course down to 12 holes, yeah. add a little six-hole par three, so you've still got 18 holes, like mm-hmm. as a technical matter, right? But you've got kind of you 12... Slice, you can slice it any way you want. Yeah, and absolutely. Even have, if you, have you been down to Belmont? Absolutely, yeah. 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 So, and, and what's really cool, I like about it is, and I don't even know if this was intentional by them, but where the, the way the routing works yeah. in the clubhouse is you could play just the first three. Absolutely. And call it a day. Yep. Yeah, and it's kind of seamless, right? Like you, I mean, it, that that's the sort of magic of it. You know, Brian and I, we we did Pinehurst together as well. We've been to Bandon, we've done Sweetens, we've you know, we've done sort of, we we've done a lot of traveling together and sort of seen all the different ways that you can kind of, you know, uh, skin the cat, so to speak. And and you know, Pinehurst does it great too with the cradle there. I, mean, I think Brian and I agreed. As good as the golf courses are at, at, at Pinehurst. 
the cradle is probably the most fun part of, of that entire resort. I mean, am yeah. I wrong? Yeah, right there, barefoot <laughs> with one club. And yeah. that's <laughs> what the plan is for the short course here. There aren't going to be any golf cart pass. We'll have Sunday bags. It's yeah. walking only unless, you know, you're handicapped and you take the handicap cart, which is a whole different matter. But when you're out there, it's, it's a walking course, like band. Yeah. It, there are no yeah. golf cart pass. One of my favorite things about band is, is it's just golf and nature. There's yeah. just nothing else, which is what it, what it should be. Cradles, bro. I think I think I, Josh, I sent you a picture when we, did. we were down there this spring, and yeah. we were we were we were on the cradle probably way way later than we were allowed to be, and basically pitch black, just banging balls around. It's so it was, good. It was well, great. but it's that so gets good. into you know conversations about lighting golf courses and so forth, which some people might say affects wildlife and this and that, but. You know, I mean, you can take teak times up to 10 p.m. in the summer, sure. you know, and, and expand golf, the accessibility of golf that much more. I'm all for it with, with LED lights these days, you know. So these are all things where I think, again, there are no rules and, and, in golf. And you got you to do you know? I mean, this, and is, it, this is an aside, but literally I got a text from my brother-in-law last night. We went took my nephew. Apparently, uh, they got they, they had a tea time. He was, he, my, my nephew's, you know, eight or nine years old. He's actually in the first tea program there. And they went out to play the red course, the yep. really short nine-hole course. I think their tee time was like 6.47. And the starter looked at him sideways and like, what are you doing? And like, we're, we're going to play our tee time. And he, he, my, my brother-in-law kind of said that the, the starter kind of scoffed at them. Like, it's going to be dark in 15 minutes. And just drove off and kind of gave him attitude. And, he, and he's like, yeah. we got three holes in. Yeah. Yeah. And they loved it. They yeah, had a great good. time. And guess exactly. what? They paid. Absolutely. <laughs> wow. Um, listen. I, I think we should probably leave it. To, I get the sense that we could talk here for like five hours. Yeah, we could. And I know you got places to go. I know. I know. Uh, they, we've got two. Um, what was I going to say? There, there's a lot of things we haven't even touched on. I know. Yeah. Like I know you're. Anybody listening to this should definitely follow both you at least on Instagram. I know Josh is really active on Instagram. You're doing a lot of stuff with like Dormy Network. We haven't oh, yeah. touched on yeah, yeah. A, a bunch of other stuff. I know you just did the the hundred hole hundred, hundred hole, hole hike for youth on course. course. Yep. Yep. We didn't really touch on that. There's a, there's a there's a project that we're not allowed to talk about that we've talked about off camera that we're really excited <laughs> about. We, we, we won't go there, but I, yeah. but you want you're going to want to follow uh, Brian to, to learn about. So you got DC, Brian some DC related golf yeah. news that he's right. working on. So Brian is is Kington Golf, uh, and I'm on Instagram at DC Link Soldier. There you go. Uh, glad you, so yeah, glad you put that in. Yeah. Uh, all right, guys, I, I appreciate. Well, let's it do very it again, much. man. This is, this is all, I know you've been talking about it for yeah, a long time. Yeah, it's always good to see you. Glad we're able, able to do it. It was great, right, brother. Yeah, great talking. Appreciate you, Alex. I don't have a good golf game, but I don't really care. I'm a I'm a regular dude living in DC. And I want to know about DC-centric golf stuff. If you can tell me something that I don't already know, then that is great for me. I don't want the regular stuff. I want exciting stuff. I want different stuff. I don't want stuff I can't hear elsewhere. But I want it to be about DC golf. 